All right, hello, welcome to my talk. Um, my name is Heinan Marx. I work at Spiral Genetics, and hence the cute little DNA uh, motif on the left. And I just wanted a random number. That's all I wanted. So, in my work, I work with DNA sequences. DNA sequences are a lot of fun. Uh, they're single molecules. Every one of us has three billion DNA bases in every single cell of their body. And basically, they're the same. They were what make us us. That's what the difference between me and you is. That's the difference between me and a plant is, a bacterium. All life that we know about has DNA. It's based on it. This is not what this talk is about. DNA can be represented as a string. It actually has an alphabet of four. The alphabet is A, C, G, and T. Uh, this is an example of such a string. In fact, I was working with what are called DNA reads. These are short snippets of DNA, typically around 100 base pairs. A base pair is a character for us. And they can go longer, they can go shorter. But in my case, I was working with an algorithm that worked with DNA reads. These DNA reads needed to be processed. And one of the assumptions we made was that the size of the read was uniform throughout the entire sample. Now, a DNA sequencer typically will give you a, a constant size DNA read from, from its output. So that was generally a good assumption, but we were getting to the point where newer sequencers were not doing that, and also to situations where better statistical methods allowed us to filter our DNA reads, and then we could cut out junky parts of the read, but still keep the good parts. And so we were getting variations on the DNA read size. And so I needed to vary the size of my DNA reads going into this algorithm, and that was my task. So I'm a TDD kind of guy. I wrote the test I, uh, for this thing, and basically I wrote a test that took our algorithm and varied the sizes of the reads. And so what I wanted was I wanted a test. It would take too long to cross the whole range. So I wanted a test that picked a random read size, and then within that read size, it would vary that read size within 10 or 20%. That was what I needed, that was my unit test. And so I thought, okay, this is, oh. Um, furthermore, because this was a test, it was important to get, a good, to get good coverage over multiple runs of the entire range. That is, and I didn't want to emit any DNA um, sizes. And furthermore, it was important to test the edge cases. Specifically, we had a tricky edge case at 255 base pairs that I needed to worry about. So it was important that we didn't miss those. Now, I'm an engineer. Um, if you were in Walter Brown's talk just now, he gave a great talk about the random header. He, he gave it from a computer science point of view, I think, and it was very interesting. But I'm an engineer, if you know my talks, I want to do something practical. I want to get stuff done. Um, that's what's in my blood. I want to get my program finished. And so, I am about to put a terrible thing up on the screen. I wrote this. <laughs> yeah, um, this started when I was a kid and I wrote um, a game, you know, and, and the game, this is what we did. But I was a kid, I didn't know any better, you know. Now I know better. But I was lazy and I was thinking, this is just a unit test, you know. Uh, this is, whoops, uh, this is good enough for a unit test. It's not production code. It's not going to run in real life. Uh, I, I was rationalizing, I think the psychological term is. And of course, if you went to Walter Brown's talk, or if you watched STL's video, or if you read Ben Dean's uh, blog, or if you went to a million other places, you know, this is terrible. This is terrible in like at least three or four ways. RAND is bad. Modulo is bad. This is bad. Don't do this, okay? I thought I was being quick and clever and lazy and, you know, again, it's just a unit test. This is good enough. I just wanted a random number. So, for the purposes of this talk, I'm going to generate random numbers between 0 and 99, which is what this code badly, very, very badly does, uh, mm -hmm. maybe. Uh, however, in real life, that's not what my unit test did, but I'm going to omit all the additions and subtractions that would have made it go to the true range, okay? Once, and again, once I had that number between 0 and 99, I wanted to vary around that number plus or minus, say, 10%. So I went 
And I remembered something about Rand being bad. I had not watched SDL's talk yet. I had not read Ben Dean's talk, uh, blog yet. This was actually a few years ago, okay? So I knew that Rand was bad, and I went to the manual and saw this little bit here. The lower order bits are much less random than the higher order bits. And what am I doing? I'm taking those beautiful low, higher order bits that are more random, and I'm throwing them away into the garbage, okay? Blah! I'm keeping those awful lower order bits and throwing away the good stuff. It's exactly the opposite of what you want to do. Cle clearly, this is a bad idea. But it's just a unit test, right? This is not real production code. Uh, you know that, that little guy with the devil on your shoulder, right? He's whispering, it's, it's good enough. Module is good enough. You know, you're going to test things. It's just a test. Random is too complicated. Well, so what do they do? I'm an engineer. I wrote a unit test for the unit test. I wrote code that exercised the random number generator, the so-called random number generator I showed in the previous slide, and looked at the DNA sequences that I got from those numbers. And you know what? They were terrible. STD RAND is not good enough. Module is not good enough. What happened was that I was not catching those edge cases that I needed. And that's the whole point of the unit test, right? The unit test needed to catch those edge cases. I was getting poor coverage of the edge cases with, this, with my RAND and with my Modulo. This was terrible. Don't do that. I realized that I can't do this. So I sighed and I th said, okay, well, I guess random it is. So what did I do? I went to DuckDuckGo. I typed in C++, random. I was running in C++11, and what came up was STL's talk uh, from 2013. I went and watched it, and um, it's a really good talk. He gives you some nice guidelines and explains why things are done the way they are. And to sum it up, if I may, in three lines, use the random C++ header, use the Mersenne twister to produce as a, as a generator, Seed the generator with random device, this is entropy, and then use an STD uniform inter, um, distribution to generate the actual random numbers. Okay, I can do that. But I had some questions after watching STL's talk. What is entropy exactly? To me, I was trained as a chemical engineer, so entropy is the amount of work you can get from a heat source using a Carnot engine. This didn't really make sense, okay? What exactly is STD random device? People show examples of using it, but it wasn't quite clear whether it was a function, an object. I wanted to explore that a little bit. Um, STL says that you should avoid the stack, putting the, the Mersenne twister, by the way, MT19937, is the Mersenne twister for all practical purposes. And he said, avoid putting it on the stack. He says that that is because it's huge, and it is. Um, but were there, was there more to it than that? Do I, is, in my situation, I work in, again in, in, um, with DNA, and so I work with 512 gigabyte machines. Putting 5,000 bytes in the stack is a rounding error, okay? So I didn't really care, but maybe there's more stuff to go. And then remember that I was generating a random size to my DNA sequence, and then I wanted to vary that DNA sequence within a random range. So I need to generate a random number in a loop, and then based on that random number, generate another random number, okay? So the question is, could I construct a uniform int distribution inside of a loop because, and I knew from SDL's talk that, for example, you cannot do this with the Mersenne twister, that it's expensive to construct. But he was silent about whether you could do that with a uniform int distribution. And so I wanted to know that. Can I, is it cheap to construct? Is it cheap to use? Can I do that in a loop? Walter Brown, on the other hand, actually made his static. But I couldn't do that because I needed to reconstruct it based on the DNA size that I had. You're shaking your head. Oh, okay, so uh, Walt, uh, Walter says that he only made the static in one example. So, by the way, this is going to be the outline of my talk. The rest of my talk is going to be about my search for answers 
finding the answers to these questions to the best of my ability. And the conclusion to my talk is going to have nothing whatsoever to do with the answer to these questions. It was a very surprising thing that I learned, and it's going to change the way I write code. And I want to share that with you, and hopefully it will change the way you guys write code as well. So entropy, what is it? Well, it comes from STD random device. It might block when it runs out. Uh, I'm not sure if STL said it might block. Uh, some people said it might block. Uh, it wasn't clear. What does it mean to run out of entropy? What is entropy? What is an entropy pool? What does this all mean? How do you run out of it? Again, to me, entropy is, is sure, I know it's randomness, but how do you run out of entropy? So entropy is randomness. In fact, I, like I said, I studied chemical engineering, so I'm not a computer scientist, but I, I did study statistical, statistical thermodynamics, and I knew that entropy was the number of states that an ensemble can take, and that is essentially randomness, right? If, if something's very well organized, there are few ways that it can be very well organized, but if something's random, there's lots of ways it can be random, okay? And so entropy is randomness. Computers... Okay, we heard something slightly different in the keyword in the in the uh, keynote this morning, um, but computers are by nature not random; they are deterministic, and that's a great feature of computers. I am relying on the computer, my MacBook Pro here, to show the same slides that I prepared earlier in the same order that I prepared them, and I would be very very upset if that didn't happen. Okay, so God forbid that my computer should start being non-deterministic. Computers can be pseudo-random. Walter Brown explained that very nicely in, in his talk. By the way, who was in Walter Brown's talk? Let me get a show of hands. Okay, so I won't assume that you guys were there. Um, he really covered the header nicely, and I think my talk will mesh nicely with what he covered, and I won't repeat much. Computers can be pseudo-random, and that can be nice because a pseudo-random sequence is repeatable. And what happened here? Okay. So, so here's my proposed random number generator to, to produce real randomness, okay? This is a random number generator. You need to look at me now. Um, this is my random number generator. It's a D20, okay? It's an icosahedron. It has the numbers from 1 to 20 painted on it. You roll it, and you get a random number. It's really clever. 14, there you go. So 14 is today's random number. And so we could make a random number by taking me, sh you don't have to look at me anymore, uh, shrinking me into a really tiny size, giving me a little tiny whiteboard, okay? This little tiny person will roll the die, write the random numbers on the whiteboard, and then requests would come in for random numbers, and as they come in, the tiny person would erase them off the whiteboard and, produce, and give you the random numbers, okay? This is what a random number generator, that is a random device, basically does. Now note, it takes a finite time to roll the die, okay? So that it is not, you cannot produce entropy instantaneously. Randomness cannot be produced instantaneously. In fact, it's a fundamental, as far as I know, it's a fundamental quantum mechanical law that it will take time to produce anything that produces energy. And so any time that you're going to do something random, it will take a finite amount of time to do that, okay? So it takes time to produce entropy. That is physical law. And thus, you can see that if the rate of supply is less than the rate of demand by the kernel, you are gonna run out. That is, I, the, the little person that we shrunk and stuck inside the CPU will not be able to produce numbers on the whiteboard fast enough because the kernel is gonna be asking for them back, and so he's gonna be erasing them, and the, the whiteboard will always be empty, and thus you ran out of entropy. So that's what it means to run out of entropy. And now an entropy generator might block 
until more entropy is available. So that means that basically the little man in the, or the little person, let's not be sexist, the little person inside the computer is going to have a clear whiteboard and he's furiously rolling the die and looking at what it is and writing the number and that kernel's demanding more. So the kernel's just gonna have to wait until he, roll, he or she rolls the die and produces that number, okay? So that's what it means to block until more entropy is available. Now the standard is silent about blocking, as far as I could tell. And to me, when the standard is silent about something, that means it can happen, or it doesn't have to happen. So let's talk about STD random device a bit. A random device produces entropy, okay? It can be used as a temporary, it's a C++ object. That wasn't exactly clear to me from the examples. The example's always instantiated, but it turns out you don't really necessarily have to do so. You can use it as a generator, okay? This might be anathema to some people, but you can. It actually does produce random unsigned bits. And Walter, okay, Walter's probably offended at this point because he, as he said, random device really is, uh, produces random bits. But if you need a uint um, number and that uint is exactly the size produced by your random device, and random device will tell you what that size is, it has a min and a max uh, method, then that actually can be good enough. And operator function call will return that random number, and that random number will be determined by your hardware and the implementation. So note that this is a tricky thing. We talk a lot in this conference about implementation dependent, right? And the, the standard guys love to do that because then it passes the buck onto guys like SDL who have to worry about it instead of figuring it out themselves. But there are usually good reasons for that. But in this case, it's also hardware dependent. So your implementation might do something and then you'll go to another piece of hardware and something different might happen. And what you really need to know about standard random device is it can throw. This is really important and it can throw when it cannot generate a random number. This isn't the standard, okay? So this is really tricky because you're Test system, your development system might all produce random numbers beautifully, and then you go to some other piece of hardware at your customer site, and for whatever reason, random, uh, random device can't generate random numbers, it's gonna throw an exception, and because you never expected an exception to come there, you never caught it, and your application is gonna blow up, and you're gonna be in trouble. So be aware that random device might throw, and it might throw on somebody else's hardware, okay? So the, just the fact that you tested it on your hardware doesn't mean it's always gonna work. So please, keep that in mind. Furthermore, random device doesn't have to be truly random. Again, scare quotes, whatever that means. It might be pseudo-random, and it probably is slow. I looked into the implementation on my machine. My machine's a MacBook Pro running uh, Ubuntu 16.04, and it is using slash dev and GCC 5.1. Um, it's using slash dev slash urandom. Uh, urandom is a device, a Linux device, that generates a random number that is, if the hardware can supply it, should be random. But it, when it runs out, instead of blocking, that's what dev random will do. Instead of blocking, it will switch to a pseudo-random, in this case, a Mersenne twister, uh, to generate randomness. So in fact, um, my uh, random device will never block. It will switch to a Mersenne twister, but it doesn't do that very effectively. So let's talk about generators a bit, okay? Again, I watched STL's talk. STL, I think, was pretty clear. Use the Mersenne twister. There's two flavors. There's the Mersenne Twister 19937, and there's the 64-bit version. The first is a 32-bit version. Seed it with STD random device. It's pseudo-random. It's deterministic. It's fast. These are all great things. And in fact, for my unit test, I wanted something pseudo-random. Why? Because the unit test is testing my code. Sometimes something will go wrong. And when something goes wrong, I want to reproduce it. So I printed out my seed in the unit test, I logged it, and then when there was an error, and this actually happened, when there was an error, if I had truly random number generator, I wouldn't be able to reproduce my error because the next run might have worked just fine, okay? So 
here's a, here's a hint. If you're going to use unit tests with random numbers, log your seed, and then you can reproduce your unit test exactly when it fails and fix your bug. And that's exactly what happened. That's exactly what I did. I had a failure. I went to the log. I grabbed the seed. I hard-coded it in. Instead of random device, I just put the number, and I reproduced it 100%, and I fixed the bug. Life was good. So I said it was fast, and I said it was faster than a random device. So when I say something like that, I want to measure it. I'm an engineer. I don't believe it when somebody tells me something's fast. So I measured it. By the way, I'm not, I don't have any code for this talk because all the code is really trivial. Um, but I'm, I'll be glad to share if somebody really wants it. But basically, I wrote a loop that generates a billion random ints. I don't think I need to share that code with this audience, I hope. And what it does is when I used random device to generate the random numbers, it took 44 seconds. Um, and when I used the Merson Twister, it took 3.6 seconds. So sure enough, the Merson Twister is fast. It's great. Everything is good. Remember, however, random device might be hardware. It's multi-threading. Multi-threaded behavior is not clear. It's not clear what happens when you access it simultaneously from multiple threads. Does it serialize the access to it? Does it give you the same result? It's not clear. It's tricky, OK? And the Merson Twister can be made thread local, and so each thread has its own copy. And that may be a very good idea, in fact, because if it's not, as Walter Brown told us, you're going to have to serialize access to it. But if every thread has its own copy, you have to be careful to initialize them correctly. If you initialize every single thread with the same seed, you are going to get the exact same sequence in every thread. Now, maybe that's what you want, but maybe it's not what you want. So think about what you're doing and initialize carefully. And remember that random device might not behave nicely under simultaneous access. So my suggestion would be produce your initialization first then get your threads going and supply the initialization to the threads later. So you can do the initialization sequentially. Or you can just serialize access to the random device. It doesn't really matter. So back to my plan. Everything was going well. Uh, STL's guidelines really did a nice job. Um, they certainly made my unit test work. I, I could make it work. But I got to thinking. And I got the note that this slide is the reason I'm not a billionaire. So I started thinking instead of making money. And it occurred to me that some questions still were out there. The Mercent Twister is pretty good, but it's 5,000 bytes on the stack. And it's slow to initialize. Now, officially, the Mercent Twister is 2,504 bytes on the stack, at least the ones we're using here. But I. Again, I'm an engineer. I actually went and did a size, t a size of on the generator, and I got 5,000 bytes. I don't know if this is a bug. I think it's a bug. I'm not sure. Uh, yeah? Uh, it's a possible implementation cleverness. Boost manages to save 2x the space at significant implementation complexity. Uh, VC does not. Sounds like your implementation of lib twist is quite quick and try to do that. Here. OK, so STL says that. Um, this might be an implementation cleverness, basically. So I'm, I'm essentially trading space for speed. And um, that might be it. Interestingly enough, the 64-bit Mersenne Twister was uh, 2,504 bytes in the stack. So all right. Um, I also said it was slow to initialize. And again, when I say something is fast, I'm going to measure it. I'm also going to measure it when I say something is slow. All right, so I wrote a loop. I initialized the Merson Twister, and oh my god, it's slow. It took 15 seconds to initialize it a million times. Okay, Remember, I was generating a billion numbers with the Merson Twister, twi the Merson Twister in 3.6 seconds. And here, to, gener to initialize it a billion times would take 15,000 seconds, i.e. hours. Okay, Many, many hours. So it's very, very slow to initialize. In fact, it's slower than random device. Well, so you might say to me, well, pff, I'm not going to initialize it um, a million times or a billion times. You know, I'm, Why should I use random device? I'm going to use operator function call, and I'm going to do it correctly. But there's a catch. If you write code like this, OK, and you put the Merson Twister on the stack, 
every single time that you call F, you are going to initialize your Meersen twister, okay? And now, remember, initializing the Meersen twister is very, very slow. So if you call F repeatedly, you are going to get a serious slowdown in your code because of this function. And so, to me, the fact that the Meersen twister was huge in 2,504 bytes or 5,000 bytes in the stack was a minor problem. But this is a major problem, and this, is, to me, is the major reason why you should not ever put the Meersen twister on the stack. In the case of my unit test, I was pretty sure that I was going to put it in the beginning of the unit test and I was only going to call it once. But you know what? I made it static anyway. And when you make it static, you don't have to worry about it. Now you only initialize it once and things are better and faster. So back to the guidelines from STL's talk, they really make sense. Use STD random device to seed your generator and keep the Mersenne twister off the stack. It doesn't belong there. Make it static, make it thread local. If you really, really want to put it on a stack, do it, but beware construction costs. Don't put it in a situation where it's called over and over and over again. If, for whatever reason, you're running on an embedded system, 2,504 or 5,000 bytes is too much. Uh, the standard offers min STD RAND. It's much smaller footprint, it's much faster, and it, but its cycle is much smaller, okay? So that it will repeat itself a lot sooner than the Mersenne Twister, which essentially will never repeat itself in somebody's lifetime, okay? Again, I'm me, so I said something was faster. What did I do? I measured it, and sure enough, it is not faster. It turns out that the Mersenne Twister is actually faster than min std rand. So, okay, the only reason then to really use min std rand is if it is, if, if that 2,504 bytes on the stack is really important to you. Okay, a little diversion. This is Marin Mersenne. He was a French priest, lived in the 17th century, and a really interesting guy. We're gonna have a slight detour into history of science. He was the guy who discovered, he's called the father of acoustics because he discovered the relationship between the frequency of a vibrating string and its length and, and that early physics and the relationship to the notes and the frequency relationship between the notes. He didn't get it quite right, but he was pretty darn close for somebody living in the early 17th century. You can only imagine what it was like to do science back then. He, and I'm going to take, I, I learned this from watching uh, Alex Stepanov's uh, talks at A9. He is the father of the scientific journal, and this is really, really cool. He was the first guy in the world, in the whole world, to get the idea of writing to scientists, getting their results, and then publishing them out to other scientists. So the idea of scientists publishing their results and giving them to other scientists original, originates with Marin Mersenne back in the 17th century. Nobody was doing this yet. And so this was the foundation to scientific journals, to things like the Royal Society. The, there was one in France too. There was one in, in what, it wasn't yet Germany. There was societies of scientists that got together to exchange results. This is all thanks to his work. And so that of course led to the scientific conference. And so in a way, Marin Mersenne is responsible for CPP Khan. So thank you for that. <laughs> he is also known for Mersenne primes. And Mersenne primes are what the Mersenne twister uses and why the Mersenne twister is so named. Mersenne primes are prime numbers that have the property of being two to the n minus one, where n is prime. So m sub three is seven, two to three minus one is seven, m sub seven is 127, okay? Note that not every prime n produces a prime number in this way, um, but in fact, they're quite rare. The largest known Mersenne prime is m74,207,281, and it's a 22 million digit number. It's ridiculously huge. The, there is a list on Wikipedia that you can find of all the Mersenne primes. I think there's 30 or 40 of them uh, right now that are known, and there are people constantly looking for new ones. Why MT19937? 
it's because the period of STD MT19937 is the 19,937th Mersenne prime, which is a 6,000 digit number. So think about this. If you are generating random numbers with your, with, with your unbelievable processor that can, that let's say it's, oh, not even terahertz. What's, what's past terahertz? I don't know. Let's say it has a cycle time of 10 to the minus 18 seconds. You're still going to die of old age before you're even close to running out of random numbers with something like that. This, this period, before you're repeating yourself, the period of the random number generator is humongous. Finally, MT19937, and Walter Brown touched upon this, is a type def of the Mersenne Twister engine. The Mersenne Twister engine takes a whole bunch of parameters and does mathematical magic with them and produces the, the, Mersen, the, the Mersenne Twister engine. You cannot play with these parameters willy-nilly. Again, Walter Brown said that very nicely. If you play around with these, I think um, he said something about being a fool. Um, don't do that unless you really, really, really know what you're doing because you probably are not going to get a good random number generator and certainly not better than what we have here. A couple of the interesting numbers to note is that 32 is the word size of the uh, engine. Uh, 624 is the state size of the engine. So we're going to store 624 32-bit numbers. And of course, notice that 32 times 624 is just short of 2,500. So that's most of your 2,504 bytes is that array of 624 words. And that's where the size of this comes. Obviously, you can make it smaller, but then it won't be a good um, engine. If you really, really want the dirty details, I refer you to the original paper. Uh, about the Mersin Twister. It's from 1998, so it's pretty recent, and yet it's still good enough that we've had a lot of experience with it and know that it's a pretty good generator. So that's the end of the diversion about Mersenne. Really cool guy. Gives the name. Uh, back to our talk. Back to C++. So the guidelines seem to make sense, but hang on a second. This talk was inspired by STL's talk in 2013. I was not the only person inspired by STL's talk in 2013. Professor Melissa O'Neill at Harvey Mudd College also watched the talk, and she writes about it in Reddit, and I know that putting that URL is useless to you guys, and even more useless to you guys out there watching this at home. Uh, so you can either search reddit.com for PCG random or trust tiny URL and notice I put the preview in there so you can actually check that it's going to Reddit and not to my secret evil malware site. But you're still trusting tiny URL that they don't send you to some malware site. But anyway, I urge you to go read Melissa O'Neill's discussion of how she came up about, how she watched STL's talk and came up with PCG. PCG random is her better random number generator, pseudo random number generator that she came up with a couple of years ago in 2015. Um, she published, uh, she wrote a paper about it. I don't believe it's been published yet. And um, there is also a C++ uh, library that's compatible with random, with a random header that's on GitHub at this address. It's much, much smaller in size than MT19937. And it's much faster than MT19937. If you go to her website, www.pcgrandom.org, her paper is there. Her paper is really interesting reading. I urge you to try and read it. It's not that bad. Um, the mathematics is, is, pretty, is quite readable, in my opinion. She also has comparisons of the various random number generators that are very interesting and enlightening. And she runs them through statistical tests, and she shows where the Mersenne Twister falls short and where PCG Random supposedly does better. Now I say that it's faster than Mersenne Twister, so what am I going to do? I'm going to measure it. Sure enough, it's two and a half times faster in generating a billion random numbers than the Mersenne Twister. But it's not in the standard. And if it being in the standard is important to you, then obviously you can't use it. I got to say, the library that I downloaded from GitHub made it really easy to use with the random header, and it was not a problem. All you have to do is not type std colon colon. Okay, it's not that big a deal. Obviously, since it was invented in 2015, we have much less real life experience with it. 
And so there might be some bug in there. I'm not in a position to evaluate this mathematically, not even close, and she's much smarter than me. But presumably, her paper will go to peer review and will be looked at by people who are qualified to judge it. And, I, and Walter Brown told us that there is actually a standards proposal to include it in a later standard, possibly. And so that would be really cool. It seems to be a very nice random number generator. Another really nice feature that I like about PCG is that it has multiple streams. What that means is that you seed it with one number, but you can have a constant that varies across the generator, and this will produce a different sequence of random numbers for the same seed. This is really nice when you're doing multiple threads, because remember I talked about the initialization problem. This can avoid the initialization problem because you could use the thread ID for that constant. The, the constant does not have to have any entropy in it. It just has to be different. You're still going to get a good series of random numbers, but you're going to get a different series of random numbers. And you can use, and, and Melissa O'Neill's algorithm will produce more streams than you'll ever have threads, I promise you. So go read her paper, go read her website at least, um, and check out the party tricks while you're at it. Okay, so that's generators. Let's talk about the uniform int distribution. Specifically, my question was, can I instantiate it in, in an inner loop? This was my big worry because I was generating a random number and then I was generating a random number based on that random number. So I was generating inside of a loop. We know that generating the Merson twister engine is very slow and you shouldn't do that. What's the case with uniform int distribution? Well, I did what I always do, I peeked. I looked into the implementation in GCC 5.1 and obviously your, your implementation may be different. And what the constructor does, at least in my implementation, is it stores its two template arguments. Remember, the int distribution takes two template arguments and those are the range of the distribution, right? The range, of course, is inclusive, as STL explains. That's because you might want to make the range cover the entirety of your integer space. And if it's off by one, that is the end is one past the end as we normally do, you're not going to be able to get that last integer because you only can specify that as your end, right? You can't specify a 32-bit integer that's one past the end of 32-bit integers. So the range is inclusive. The constructor stores those two arguments into member variables. It's trivial. Operator function call branches and calculates. It does some multiplications and divisions. There's not much code to it. It's pretty straightforward. In fact, it was really interesting to check it out. Standard, um, this uniform inter integer distribution is one of those things that would be really hard to come up with if you had to, and I think STL had to, uh, but I didn't. I, got, I didn't read his version, but I read the GCC versions. But once you read it, it's really straightforward and simple to understand, and that's really cool. I, I think it would take me many, many hours to come up with it, but it is not that complicated to understand. So I suggest check out your implementation, read the code. It's not much code. It's maybe 10, 20 lines of code, something like that. And I converted it to math and looked at it. It was very, very nice. And so, I, I, looked at the, I looked at the implementation of the integer distribution. It's really straightforward, but of course, I want to measure this, right? I'm not going to just say stuff, I'm going to measure it. And so this time I'm going to show some code. This is the code that I use in all of the setups, basically. Um, I generate a billion random numbers using the integer distribution, in my case, between 0 and 99 inclusive, and it took 23.4 seconds to generate these random numbers. Notice that I'm constructing the uniform int distribution outside the loop, right? This is how we learn to do this in basic C++. Never construct something inside the loop because every time through the loop, you're gonna have to construct it, then destroy it. Then the next time through the loop, you're gonna construct and destroy it again, right? And in this case, you're gonna do it a billion times. But I wanted to know the cost of constructing it. So I stuck that constructor into the loop. And I would expect the results to be about 10% slower, just a bit slower. And sure enough, it was four and a half times faster. That was my reaction. I couldn't believe it. I 
tested Einstein's assertion about the definition of insanity, which is repeating the same thing and expecting to get different results. I repeated the experiments, I recompiled it, I got the same result. I, I stared at disbelief, I actually went to sleep, I was like, no. Uh, this made no sense. So the next morning um, or the next evening, I, I got back to this and I thought, well, okay, it's the optimizer, right? It's 2016, optimizer is totally rock. It's, I, Chandler may know what they're doing, I don't know what they're doing. They are doing amazing things. So it's probably the optimizer, so let's test that. It, here are the numbers for the uh, constructor in and outside the loop. I turned off the optimizer, I reran it, and I got exactly what I expected. Okay, so the optimizer is doing clever stuff here. But what's scary about this is that the optimizer is optimizing a situation which I would expect to be bad into something that's better. This is really scary because what am I gonna do now? Change all my code to put constructors into loops? I don't think that's a smart thing to do necessarily. The Furthermore, for all I know, this is some quirk in GCC's implementation, and if I use GCC, the, the latest, GCC 5.1 is not even close to being the latest, right? If, maybe if I switch versions or I switch to Clang or to Visual Studio, I'm not gonna get this, maybe it'll be worse, who knows, right? So, this was a little scary. So I decided, okay, I'll poke into this a little bit. And I poked into the assembly code, and I, um, it turned out it wasn't even that complicated. Um, can you see that code? Uh, it's not really important if you see it or not, okay? Uh, this is the code from operator function call that gets called when, whenever you're generating a random int integer distribution, okay? As, as I said, there's not much code. This is actually half the code. What it does is it branches between two situations. If the integer distribution is bigger than the random number uh, generator uh, range that it can produce, then it does one thing. If the integer distribution is smaller than the range that the random number generator produces, then it does another thing. And of course, the random number engine will tell you how big numbers it generates. As Walter showed us, it has, it's one of the methods that you call on it. And so, I'm, in my case, the, I'm going from zero to 99, the random number generates a integer from zero to four billion, whatever two to the 30 second is, and so clearly I'm smaller, and so that's the branch we're taking, and I went into the debugger with the optimizer turned off, and I single stepped through the code as I called operator function call. This is the code for operator function call. I single stepped through that code, and every line executed basically, okay? So then I turned the optimizer on, I left the debugging symbols on, and I single stepped through the code, and this is the code that got executed. Now, I don't know if this is enough to explain. I mean, it was four and a half times faster. I didn't cut out four, you know, um, enough 80% uh, of the code to make it four and a half times faster. There might be cache effects going on here. I really don't know. I, I poked in a little more. I, didn't, I ran out of time before I had to come here and talk, before I could really figure out. But what I do know is I now have a subject for next year's talk. So this was really, really interesting and very surprising. And but, but clearly the optimizer is doing something. I think it has something to do with the locality of references here, that when the optimizer sees the constructor in the loop, it knows that we're calculating these values already and, and doesn't repeat itself. It, I don't know, I'm not gonna second guess it. It's smarter than I am. It's doing its job nicely. This is really cool and yet really scary. So guidelines. I'm not gonna give you guidelines. I'm an engineer and I believe in engineering judgment, okay? Engineering judgment is about taking the trade-offs in your choices and weighing them against each other and that's what engineering skill and judgment is all about, right? There's always trade-offs, there's always judgment. I think we're all good enough that we're not gonna make silly mistakes. If you're worried that you will, go watch the video of Walter Brown's talk that was just before me here he will cover the random number, he covers the random header very nicely and exhaustively and tells you about some pitfalls, okay? So once you're past that bump, okay, that's where your judgment comes in. Random is safe. If you follow STL's guideline, you will never probably get in trouble. The only way you might have a problem is if that 2,504 bytes on the stack is a problem for you. 
if you're in an embedded system, that could be a problem. And yeah, I actually have one of my toy systems that I do as a hobby that, where that would be a problem, okay? But generally, that's not a problem. Random is safe. The random header is safe. The PCG algorithm is fast, small, and simple. It's cool. I really like Melissa O'Neill's webpage. She's really smart. Her paper is great. And I want to use it, you know? And if you're, if you're in a situation where you just want to use the coolest stuff, consider it, okay? It is not well tested. It, there might be a fatal flaw in it for all I, I know. She's, it certainly is not security quality random numbers. So I think Ripple will not be using it anytime soon. I hope not. Um, but it's really cool and it's fast and simple. And it would work on my embedded device. Furthermore, there's also a C interface, which gives you a simple function that you can call. And so if you don't want to bother with the C++ random header, then you don't have to. Personally, I think you should, because when you're using the C interface, you're tempted to do silly things like use the modulo operator to do a uniform distribution, which you should never, ever do. So use the C++ one. That's my choice for the trade-off. But really, the most important guideline, which actually is a conclusion, is always measure your code and s measure the speed of your code. And so what I'm going to do from now on is I am going to put performance tests into my code because it was clear to me from making this talk, and I hope it's clear to you as well, that the compiler and the optimizer can do very strange things to the speed of your code based on minor tweaks to your code. And furthermore, like I said, it would be nuts to go in and start putting all of my constructors into my loops. But if I had performance measurements for my code, I could then do this, right? And then I could put the, the constructors into loops one at a time, rerun my performance, and see what happens, OK? Uh, obviously, you use your judgment. There are probably loops where it makes no difference, where they run so slowly, and you know that. But any time you're, you're time critical, when you have that measurement of your speed, you then can experiment with the code and with the optimizer and with the settings to see what's going on and get better results potentially. So always measure. I am going to start measuring my performance religiously now from now on. And uh, just like I learned to use unit tests many years ago, and I now swear in by testing. And because right when you when you break your code, you know it, and then you can experiment with different coding implementations. I am now going to start measuring my performance and incorporating that into my test suite. I think that is the most important thing that I got out of this talk. I hope I convinced you of the same. So to conclude, STD random device generates random numbers. It doesn't do it very fast. It may not do it very well. It has some pitfalls, but it does it. In a typical system like my system, my, my laptop here, it actually generates hardware-based random numbers. Whether those are good or not depends on a lot of things, um, and I'm in no position to measure them. There are statistical tests you can use, but as we've learned this morning in the keynote, you cannot distinguish sufficiently good pseudo-random numbers from truly random numbers using, using statistical tests alone. So does it really matter? Probably not. The Mersenne Twister is a really good engine to use. STL makes that very clear. Uh, if you're a little more adventurous, you can try the PC generators. And in fact, I did try them. I, I really like them. Uh, whoops, there's a typo. Distributions are cheap to construct. They're cheap to use, so throw them in the loop. Go ahead and use them. What's really important with distributions is that you use them. Don't ever do the modulo. Now, I want to be clear, really my conclusion applies to integer distributions. I didn't measure all of the distributions, and it's very possible, and in fact I just learned this from Walter Brown's talk an hour ago, it's very possible that some of the more complicated ones are not cheap to construct and are not cheap to use. It really depends on the implementation, and as Walter Brown made it clear, the implementation is free to use the algorithm it wants in its distribution, unlike, say, the engines, where it's, where it's forced to do a different, a specific way. Um, Walter nods yes, so I hopefully got it right. And, um, but 
for integer distributions, at least in my implementation, and I don't doubt any of the other implementations are different, they're cheap to construct and use, so do so, don't be, hesitate to use them. I'm not gonna cover STD sample because I don't have time. Uh, Walter Braun covered it briefly too, but STD sample is new in C++ 17. In 14, at least on my compiler, it's available in an experimental TS, and it allows you to randomly sample from a distribution and that essentially gives you sampling without repetition. This is a really nice algorithm. When I was a kid, back when I wrote junk like the modulo and used RAND, I also wrote my sampling without repetition by what Walter calls a rejection algorithm, basically. I generate a random number. If it was not the one I wanted, I just generated another one until I got the right one. This is less than ideal. Sample will do it right. There are better algorithms. I, I did look them up, actually, and implement them since but it's available in C++17, it's new, and it looks pretty cool. But the most important conclusion, again, I'm gonna repeat myself because I think it's important, benchmark your code, measure your performance, and have the ability to be able to tweak your code and see what the effect of tweaking your code is on the performance. Again, that conclusion really surprised me. It has nothing to do with random integers, but this is where my path led me when I just wanted a random integer. So thank you for your attention. I want to acknowledge STL for his great talk that got me started and inspired the whole thing. Um, ben Dean's blog has some really nice um, observations on how not to use random number generators and is very well written. And Walter Brown's talk, I hope you go watch it. If not, obviously not in the past, but in video. Um, it's a nice introduction to the random header. And thank you very much for your attention. And I will take questions in the last few minutes. Wow, is that clear? Sure. Um, in your uh, production code, have you ever had reason to use any of the distributions other than uh, uniform imps, like the normal or whatever distributions? We went to so much work to implement that. I want to know, did it get used? So um, STL's question was, in my production code, did I ever have the chance to use the distributions other than the uniform integer? And, my, um, and the answer is yes. Um, it turns out that um, DNA sequencing, again, produces reads. So you have three billion, DNA is, your DNA is in 23 chromosomes, which are molecules of DNA, right? 23 pairs of chromosomes, actually. And those are essentially 23 strings of hundreds of millions, or going down to tens of millions on the smaller chromosomes, of characters, of these ACTG characters, okay? And what you do in modern um, sequencing, well, not, not modern sequencing, but what's called shotgun, uh, whole genome shotgun sequencing, is you chop these up into little bits randomly, Okay, and you, you read those, all right? It turns out that the way you find out whether a certain base, what its coverage, we wanna know what the coverage of a base is, okay? And it turns out, I'm not gonna go into this biology, but it turns out that's a Poisson distribution. And so we have used the Poisson distribution to simulate that system, okay? We also use normal distributions uh, because a Poisson distribution actually is a discrete normal distribution, if I remember my statistics correctly. And we, did we use any others? Uh, no, I'll just note that I wrote, I was working on the statistics program many, many years ago, back in the 90s, and it was unfortunately in C, um, where we actually implemented a whole bunch of these things. Um, so um, we used Poisson, we used Normal, and we used Uniform Int. I think I used Uniform Real. I hate that name because they're not real numbers, but let's not get into that. Uh, I didn't pick the name. Uh, so those are the four I used. Thank you. Any, any other questions? Okay, well, thank you very much for your attention.